Hey, what's up, you guys? Whether it's your first time joining us, you've been with us for every episode. Welcome to the Players Club, a podcast by the players for the people. And I'm your host, Darian Richard. <laughs> episode 16 here at the Players Club. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in last week with Christian Wilkins. We had a great episode and just all the love and appreciation, all the shares, all the new Players Club podcast fans. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. But this week, just like every week since 22, 2022 began, I was telling you we get bigger and better. I'm not going to lie. And after this episode, y'all got to give me some grace. I don't know if I'm going to be able to top this one because of the guests coming on. But we're still going to keep getting better. We're going to keep keep getting good people on. But this week, uh, we got my... He'll, he's going to correct me later, but my former coach, but will be for my, my forever coach, um, two-time national champion, winning his coach of the decade, what all those things. Um, but we got head coach uh, Dabo Sweeney coming on. Uh, give some, yeah. I know you guys wanted it. We got him on. We got him on the podcast. Yeah, he's really coming on the show. I swear, I'm not lying. He's coming on to the show. We got him on later. You're going to hear a lot of stories. Um, even some, I played for him six years, even some stories that I was kind of like, wait, what? And I feel like I've heard every coach Sweeney story done to man. I've, I've sat in, I've sitting in hundreds of team meetings and have heard almost every story he has known to man. I promise you, even in his house, I'm like, I've known him. And I was like, man, okay. He's telling, he's, I've never heard this one before. So you guys are in for a good treat later. Whether you're a Clemson fan or not, I think Coach Sweeney is somebody as, as admirable as uh, in every way, shape, or form. He's a winner. He's a he's a great businessman. He's created a great culture, program, all of the above. So you guys are in for a treat. But before we get to Coach Sweeney, I know some of you guys have asked about what is like the the pre combine draft uh, process like, pre pro day process like, and it really is simple. It's not really simple. It's actually very complex, and you kind of you get here and you figure it all out. But for a lot of guys, it's two things happen. Um, when guys go on to pursue like professional aspirations for football, once you leave college, either guys will go back home to where they're from and go train at like a facility that's close to home, um, which uh, like I said, a lot of guys will do that. They, they went to, if they went somewhere fall to school, they'll go back home um, to train. Or if some guys are from where they're, like they're playing at, they wanna go get a new experience, go see something different. Kind of, that was kind of my experience. And in, in doing that, a lot of guys go like these training facilities are kind of in these cool, cool hubs. Like you got down here in Miami, Fort Lauderdale areas, a lot, there's like a lot of facilities you can go train at. But obviously, you realize people come down here. It's the weather, by the beach, the vibes, like it's just a good place to be, uh, to get away from home for a couple months, get away from school, and just to lock in, but also have some fun. And then once you get down here, like people asking about food, like a lot of facilities will have like, like they usually have some chef contracted. Like for us, I feel like I have like, I enjoy my experience at Clemson because of the food. And I feel like God's just been blessing me because I'm in another great experience where the food is amazing. I get breakfast, lunch, and I get two dinners. They're trying to put that weight on your boy, trying to stay, you know, 195 plus. Um, so I get two meals and then, yeah, so it's been great. And that's, so that's the food situation. And then moving on, one of the things Coach Sweeney get to later, he was like, I know you're going to miss the locker room whenever you, whenever you finish playing. Like, that would be one of the things you miss is being a part of the structure and being a part of a locker room. And so for me, the process has actually been pretty seamless. I haven't had the, like, football anxiety where I'm not away from, I'm away from a locker room, away from a team, away from structure, away from meetings, because that's kind of like a lot of these facilities will kind of build that format out, format out, like that programming for you. And so I got, like, a running back group. I got some running backs from Georgia running back from Ole Miss, running back from Cincinnati, running back from North Carolina a and t And so we're all like our own little like running back group again, like kind of like in college, you had your, your running backs. And then you got, um, you got other guys on the team that play different positions, but you're all hanging out at the facility, taking naps, everybody's tired, you're kicking it, cracking jokes. You got the funny guy, you got the serious guy, you got the leader of the group, you know, just everything. It's kind of like the whole team dynamic again. So it's been really cool for me to kind of like still be part of like a team. You got coaches, you got meetings, you got workouts, you got practices. And so I really haven't had that true break from ball just yet. And hopefully I don't get that break for a little while. You know, that's kind of the, while I'm training. And so you're, all, you're doing all these things for, you got the, the combine, which is in Indianapolis, which will be like the last week of February, first week of March. 
And then every school has their own individual pro day because not everybody gets invited to Indy. Uh, you get your own pro day. And ours is March 17th, and every school has its own different one. Well, all the NFL scouts and the coaches will fly to your school and evaluate all the talent that's uh, available for that year. And then, then the hope is that all this training pays off through the 40, the bench, the vertical, the three-cone shuttle, uh, the L drill. What else? The broad jump. And then your position drills, but they'll take you through like your own drills for your position to see if you're good or not. So that's kind of the goal of all this, all this training, all this pre-draft stuff. It's like you want, you putting on this work and it is a process like never before. Like the stakes were high in college because you were obviously fighting for time and fighting for as many reps as you can get. And especially these high schools, like the programs like Clemson, like, like any major D1, D1, D1 program, it's just the stakes are always high because you're competing for a lot and a lot of pressure on you, a lot of eyes on you, a lot of expectations. But I will say, man, this, this pre-draft process, like everybody's a different like s- scenario situation. You got guys who are projected first rounders. You got guys who are projected like late round guys who want to make it to the mid round. You got guys that are mid round and want to make it to the first round. You got guys that are undrafted and want to just try to get drafted. You got guys who don't really have a shot, but just want to get, get a chance. And so you got all these different scenarios and, and it really is like, it's stressful. Because you, like for the first time, and I, I like obviously in college, like like you say, you have a team. This is like this is all on you. There's nobody like if you don't do well, there's nobody's coming to help you. There's nobody can can go make a tackle if you messed up. There's nobody can, you know, there's nobody can help you. Like in the game of football, if you don't have a you don't if you don't do great in a play, sometimes you get lucky and things just work out in your favor, and it just you know I, I missed the block, but my quarterback got the ball off. I'm like, Phew. or. The lineman might block wrong, and then the running back just makes a play, and the lineman's like, oh, my gosh, thank you for doing that. Or the DB gets beat, and his friend just helps him out and deflects a pass. You know, all these scenarios where people can help you out, in this pre-draft process, there's no help. It is literally you, and that's where the pressure comes from because, like, you got to, like, I have to get this right. I have to do well because I'm counting on myself. And so it's been, a, it's been an interesting process. I've been on it for, it's my fourth week. I got a couple more weeks left, and like I said, you just hope all the hard work pays off, and... And like, you just, you'll see how everything plays out. But what everybody's waiting for, I know y'all want to talk to me, which y'all come on the show every week to hear from me, but y'all always come here from the guests. And we got, like I said, a really good one. So coming up next, like he'll tell you at the top of the show, my always coach, Coach Dabo Swinney. Episode 16 of the Players Club Podcast. We got, honestly, my, I keep saying this every week because it keeps getting better. Probably my favorite guest. Um, this guy, just because of respect. Um, my coach, my former coach now, and I was his longest tenure player. I think that's a record to say. Super seniors to go out this year. But joining us this uh, this week is Coach Sweeney. What's up, Coach? Well, a couple things. One, <laughs> I want to make sure we send that intro to Christian Wilkins because I know he was on here. Right. I want to make sure he gets a copy of that. Second, I am always going to be your coach. I'm never going to be your yeah. former coach. I'm always going to be your coach. Indeed. Just like you're always going to be football alumni at Clemson University. Nobody Amen. Can that away. Amen. So join us, my coach. And so taking it back to when you played at Alabama. And so even if people don't know, you played at Alabama, was a receiver, you walked on. What was your experience like playing football at Alabama? Oh, man. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. Just in one word, amazing, transformational. Um, you know, uh, just uh, shaped me uh, to who I am today, that's for sure. And and I, you know, I, I, my journey there was different than maybe some. I mean, I, I, my, it was just going to college. I was the first one uh, to go off to a college, a big college. And um, my brother had been to a JUCO for a year and a half. Uh, but, you know, we just didn't really have any experience with big colleges. Nobody in my family had a degree. And uh, so I wanted to go to the University of Alabama, first of all. And, and I'd always played three sports. And and I felt like I had the best chance to maybe make it in football. At the time, I think there was like 95 scholarships. And I was like, man, surely I can get one of those, you know. Right. And uh, that was kind of my mentality. Uh, as opposed to basketball, there was only like 15. And baseball, they don't really give full scholarships. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm, so I'm going to – it was just a dream, you know, chasing my dream. And, and so I went uh, really with just – knew nothing about college and the whole process of it and 
got a Pell Grant student loans and showed <laughs> up and, and, uh, and next thing I know, I'm, I'm walking on the football team and, and, um, you know, ended up my red shirt freshman year. I got in a game, which was a big deal. I was like, wow. And I, you know, it was very hard. I mean, things were, things were different back then. And a lot different. You always tell us a lot different. How they treated the walk-ons and things like that. And, and, uh, but just making the team was big. And then, you know, we had to go through a whole process just to get on the team and then made the team and then actually got to, you know, and, and it wasn't like, like back then, like you didn't, everybody didn't get to stand on the sideline. Everybody didn't get to dress out. And, uh, and so I finally, they dressed me for a game against Southern Miss, my red shirt freshman year, got to play. And it was like, you know, I, life could have ended right there. Like I, you know, it was just like unbelievable, but like anytime like, pinnacle. you achieve goals, you keep moving, you know? And so uh, next thing you know, uh, my red shirt sophomore year, a couple guys got hurt. And, you know, I was ready and I prepared and all of a sudden, man, Coach McCorvey, who, you know, he right. calls me over on a Tuesday practice and says, hey, I'm going to give you a shot today. And if you do well, you're playing Saturday. And uh, it's a good thing I'd been paying attention. No uh, doubt. I'd had zero reps and sure enough, had a great practice and the rest is history. I led her three years and, and uh, you know, uh, got put on scholarship and finished up my senior year with a national championship. And. And it was different in 92. And, that you know, now it's like, you know, Alabama's, you know, if they go three years without winning a national championship, like, you know, Something's wrong. they're, they're going to fire the coach, right? And, <laughs> right. Uh, and so, But at that time, Alabama hadn't won a national championship since the 70s. And so it was the 100th year of Alabama football. It was my senior year, the centennial year. And, you know, we'd been all these years – without a national championship. And we were, we were not predicted to win. I think we were like a 13 point underdog against Miami. Wow. And we went, we went 34 to 13 in my last ever game. And, uh, and so it was a, it was just a magical experience for me. It just, a, just a time of growth. I think part of college is figuring it out. Right. No like doubt. I went to college as an 18 year old thinking I'm going to be a, a pediatrician. I was a pre-med major, a biology major for three and a half, three years. You know, I'm like, and then I just had this like moment of like, God, this isn't what I wanted to do. You know, I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I didn't love it. Um, and then I started thinking I got 10 more years of school. And yeah. uh, so, you know, I switched into hospital administration and the business school and getting a business degree. And that, that brought me back for a fifth year. Uh, Cause I, I had to, I lost some hours transferring over and, and, um, uh, Next thing you know, we win the national championship. I go out to spring practice to just watch practice. First time I've never been a part of a team in my life. Probably what you're going through right now a little bit. A little of, bit. You know, like, like okay, where's that structure? Where's my team? I'm supposed to be in workouts. I'm supposed to be somewhere. And that's a weird time. I go out to practice. The next thing I know, Coach Stallings, he's like, hey, I need a – I need you need to get a master's degree. And I'm going to pay for it. And I need a graduate assistant coach. And you start in July. And I had never even thought about coaching a day in my life. And I tried, I tried to get out of that. But so, you know, I went to Alabama when I was 18. I left when I was 31. And uh, so, so it was a, it was a, just a, just a indescribable experience in just equipping me for life. And that's really what college should do. And, and then in particular, through the game, through the struggle, through the, the striving and the grinding and the belief, even when it didn't make sense to believe, you know, through the early workouts, through the, you know, the just, you know, striving to get better, man, those, those are tools that I, that I use and live by to today. Now I agree. And that's one of the things, especially, so I walked on obviously with coach Sweeney and then played six years, was able to earn a scholarship and experience a lot of those same emotions. And I would just say, those are the things I feel like you built the program off of. I think about Clemson, I think about your time as a walk because you always tell us the stories. And so how, how was your first experience like coaching? Because obviously people see Coach Lee now. You've yeah. coached for almost half your life. Um, yeah. So what was it like when you first started coaching? Do you feel like you were good at it? Do you feel like – did you yeah. see any of this? Yeah, well, so I started coaching at 23. And um, so I started – sure enough, I started that July, like you said. Yeah, you start in July. And uh, – First of all, I had to call the guy I'd taken a job with. I was going to start in June and tell him that I was no longer going to take the job. <laughs> then I had to call Kath and tell her, you know, it's probably going to be another year for us to get married. And, you know, she was getting her master's in education. I was like, you know, I need to get this MBA. 
I kind of talked myself into it really because I was scared to tell Coach Stallings no. Uh, right. Just so, like anybody would. Like even yeah, if he I told just me didn't to... want to deal with him, you know. Right. I mean, he's just he's he's just relentless and he hounds you. And so I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go do this. But honestly, and, I, and this is honest to God truth, I, I literally never, I can honestly say I never ever thought about coaching, dreamed about coaching. I only ever thought about playing. I was going to play in the NBA. I was going to play in the NFL. I was going to the Braves. I mean, I, that's all I ever really thought about. And uh, or and then I was going to go be a doctor, and, and right. that was it. Honestly, within a week of becoming a coach, it was like this, bam, like this aha right. moment of clarity in my life. Like all of a sudden for me, there were lots of things that happened. One, it, it, I was still part of the team. I still love to compete. I realized I had way more knowledge than I even knew I had. You know, you just don't even know what you know. And, exactly. and I, had, I had all this knowledge. And and then the other thing that really uh, spoke to me that I really think like God revealed to me clearly was like everything that I had experienced in my life up to that point, all of a sudden made perfect sense to me. Right. Like things that I hated, things that, that, that I wouldn't want to go through again, things that were like, the liabilities in life now are all of a sudden my greatest assets. And I realized that I had a lot to offer. And, and I, and so I just instantly fell in love with coaching and immediately I knew this is what I'm supposed to do. Like, this is what I'm called to do. And so, you know, I, I literally started right then planning to be a head coach one day. Hmm. I didn't know if it would ever happen. Um, but you know, 15 years later, it did. But I, I, I just put my head down and went to work. And uh, I coached eight years at, at Alabama. And, and then I was out of coaching for 18 months. And, and that's then, what I was going to uh, ask you about. Because, like, a lot of people don't – like, obviously, some people that know you coached Alabama. But then the coaching staff got removed. Yep. And then you had a gap year. And I didn't notice until yeah. you started yeah. telling us the stories. What was it like not being out of coaching? What did you do? Yeah, so uh, – uh, the, my head coach got let go, and the new coach, uh, Dennis Franchoni, he came from TCU. He got hired the Alabama job, and I thought I had a chance to stay. The AD had said, hey, you know, you're the one guy that may, may consider keeping. And so I kind of hung around and helped him transition a little bit recruiting. And uh, But, you know, he, he he didn't know me, and he had his guys that were coming. And, and uh, so he calls me in and says, hey, look, you know, just, you know, I'm loyal to my guys. And I told him that. I said, well, I wouldn't want to work for you if you weren't. So I get it. <laughs> so, you know, all of a sudden I'm packing up my office and I'll never forget it, man, moving out. Uh, and I just I was so connected to my players. I mean, I loved my players. I had recruited a ton of guys there. And it was like all of a sudden I felt like a man without a country. And it was right. really strange because I was still living in Tuscaloosa and, and like, you know, like they kept moving, like they kept yeah. going. It's spring practice, you know, and in December, I'm looking for a job. In fact, I, I tried to get the receiver job at Notre Dame. Urban Meyer was the receiver coach who I didn't That's know. That's crazy. I never heard he this got, story. He got the Bowling Green uh, head coaching job. And so, man, I got Coach Stallings. I got everybody. I'm trying to get the receiver job at Notre Dame. And, man, I didn't even get to halfway to first base. Uh, <laughs> and so then I tried on a couple other jobs. I went to the convention. And, you know, and in coaching, if you don't get hired from like, you know, December to February, yeah. you're probably you're probably out for a year. It's just kind of unless something crazy happens. And uh, especially back then. And because uh, you just didn't have big staffs and things like that. Uh, so January came, nothing happened. And I'm sitting uh, in at the house in early February. And fortunately, I had a, my contract was through June. So at least I had a paycheck coming till June and I had a little time to figure it out. And, I, and also I had gotten that MBA. All right. right. And that MBA uh, was, was the reason I did that. It was, I was like, I told Kath, I said, this will be a parachute. I'm going to go coach, but this is my parachute because they fire coaches. And as For an sure. assistant, you're at the mercy of the head coach. And so uh, my, my very first strength coach, you never know how you make an impression on some way, somebody. So when I, went through that walk-on process to get on the team. And I had this crazy strength coach named Rich Wingo who literally tried to run me off every single day um, for six months. I get a phone call at the house, you know, and back in those days, Darren, you know, you like, you like had to answer the phone. And right. uh, like, and I'll never forget, Kath comes upstairs. I'm like sitting in the chair watching TV. 
And she comes in and she's like, it's it's Rico. And I'm going, and I and I went, I went, what? I mean, I, I stand straight up, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm 31. I'm scared to death. I'm 30 years old. I'm scared to death. This man. And I'm like, you never forget though. It's cause I hadn't, he had, cause he had been gone since my freshman year and, and he had, I didn't know what he was doing, but he had gone off into the development world and he had become president of this shopping center development company. And, and he calls me, I'll never forget it. He's, and he, he's, he's got this voice. He's just big. He was a linebacker for the Packers. He was on the goal line stand and the 79 national championship team in Alabama. And he just, he's this larger than life guy. He's like, and I, he goes, what are you doing, son? And I'm like, <laughs> like, oh, I'm just, uh, he goes, no, I mean, what are you doing? And uh, next thing I know, he's talking me into coming up and sitting down with him and, uh, and uh, you know, seeing what he does. So I drive to Birmingham and I go up there and he's, uh, he's like, you know, trying to get me to come and be a part of this company that builds shopping centers all the time. And of course, I'm like, I'm like, Rich, I'm a football coach. I don't, I don't know anything about this. And here's what he told me. And this is something, this is exactly what I told Tony Elliott when I hired Tony. But it's something that really is, is a lesson for everyone. His exact words to me, he said, he said, Dabo, I'm not hiring you because you know this business. I'm hiring you because of who you are. He said, I'm hiring you because I know you'll show up. I know, I know you'll put the work in. I know you know how to compete. I know the type of person you are, the type of character you have. He said, all that stuff, that's the easy part. I'm hiring you because of who you are. And, you know, and I've always hung on to that. And I, to this day, I hire people first. I recruit people first. Right. Like when I hired Tony Elliott, he never coached a running back a day in his life. And that was the first he thing he said. He goes, he goes, running backs? Coach, I said, Tony, don't worry about that. That's easy. I'm hiring you because of who you are. We'll figure that out. And he, he became the running back coach in the country. So, exactly. so that's how I got there. But I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to do it. And then he said, he says, he says, what what are they paying you at Alabama? And uh, I was making eighty thousand dollars. And he said, uh, all right, I'll pay you that salary. And I'm sitting there going. And my, I'm driving all the way driving back to Tuscaloosa. I'm like, I'm going to have to take this job. Like, I have no job. I have right. two kids, you know. And I'm like, so the next thing you know, uh, I take the job. I started that March. And so I worked for 18 months. One season turned into two seasons. I mean, there was this huge void. And I think if you're really, truly passionate about teaching and impacting people's lives, it, it, it's hard to fill that void. And that that was what. I knew I was called to do, but I wanted it to be, you know, what God wanted me to do. And, um, uh, and so, you know, when, when I got the call to come to Clemson, I just was like, wow, like this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. And how, uh, how easy of a decision was that? When was the moment where you just, you at work one day when it, like, I'm the, the coach, yeah. I'm just, yeah. How did, how did the, yeah, so, how'd you so, come to Clemson? Same thing too. He was, he coached me for one year at Alabama. He was, my receiver. Wow. he was my receiver coach for one year. And then that, that staff left and Woody McCorby came in from Clemson right. to be, to be my coach in uh, 1990 as my sophomore year, sophomore year. But he had kept up with me over the years. And so he calls me randomly out of the blue on a, on a Friday and uh, asked me if I'm interested in getting back in coaching. I said, yeah. And <laughs> Of and course. the crazy thing is it was the worst time at that point. I was very entrenched in what I was doing. You know, I was very successful, had all these things going on all over the place. And uh, we were building a house uh, and it was like it was like a faith check, you know. And so I, he called me back on Sunday. He said, you still interested? I said, yep. So he flew me up and uh, flew up there, uh, interviewed. Um, but. And when I left, I knew I would take the job if he offered me the job. And, um, you know, even though I knew I was going to take a pay cut to go take this job, I knew it's what I wanted to do. So you got the job and then you were the serious coach for a number of years. And then yep. the moment comes, uh, Coach Bowden gets removed midseason and Coach Sweeney gets moved up into the ranks. Walk us through becoming the head coach as an interim um, and then – I'll get to that point. Head, your head coach now, middle of the season. What is going on? Yeah, it was crazy. Well, you know, and there's a couple things that I think lessons in that. One, two, two things. One, just be great where you are. You know, 
you know, especially in the profession I'm in, everybody's so upward moving and so focused on, oh, I got to go get this title and get this job. And, and I'm like, you know, heck, I'd probably still be at Alabama if they hadn't fired the head coach. You know, I'm just a bloom where you play the guy. You know, I met my wife in the first grade. We started going together in sixth grade. We've been married 27 years. I've been at two places. You know, I've had many opportunities to leave, but I just – I loved my players. I really loved working at Clemson. I really loved Coach Bowden. He was great to me, and uh, my family was happy. Uh, and I had never lived anywhere other than Alabama when I moved to South Carolina. And, uh, you know, a year, a year and a half uh, – two things happened prior to that moment. Uh, uh, I tried to get the UAB job, number one. And I was, I was, I was going, leaving on a Thursday to go interview. I'm, I'm got my staff set. I got my plan. I'm fixing to go in there and man, I am going to get this, the UAB Blazers job and it's going to be Blazer nation. And we're going to build an empire in Birmingham, Alabama. I mean, I, I, I'm going home like this is, this is going to happen. And I mean, I'm literally getting ready to head up and, and get a call like, Hey, they hired somebody already. And I'm not even going to get an interview. And I'm like, I was so mad. And I was like, Oh my gosh. You know, uh, and then Nick Saban gets the job in uh, January of 07. He gets the job and he calls me, offers me a huge raise, passing game coordinator, coming back to home and all my, and I mean, I got teammates and family and friends. We talk for an hour on a Sunday, and, you know, and I'm like, man, I need a day to think about this. And, and uh, but I just, I don't know. I just, I didn't know him. I, I didn't know him at all. And, uh, you know, I just I just didn't feel like it was a week. It was literally a week before signing day. And, you know, C.J. Spiller had just come back here. And I'm just like, man, I, I just I just didn't have peace about it. And so so I stayed. Right. Same I day. can't imagine the the like that's one of those moments you look back in the movies and like if you yeah. would have stayed, went to Alabama, I just can't even imagine the, yeah. the like the moment of college football we're living in right now. That, that's crazy. You know, so sometimes the decisions that we make don't make sense. You know, I mean, it was a hundred and I don't know, fifty thousand dollar raise you know, to go take this job, and you know, it, on the surface, it all made sense, but it just didn't. It just it just wasn't the right timing for me. It wasn't the right thing for me, and and it would have been bad for Clemson. It would have been. It just wouldn't have been right, and. Uh, and the only thing I did is I asked the AD, I asked Coach Bowden, and he talked to the AD, if I could have another year. Because I only had a one-year contract. The right. contract was up in March. And I, and I told them, I said, I really want to stay at Clemson. And um, if y'all can give me another year or give me a two-year contract, then I'm staying. If not, then I have to take this job for my family. And, uh, and the AD and the, uh, Tommy Bowden, they're like, no problem. So they gave me another year on my contract. I stayed at Clemson. And, again – here, year and a half later, I'm the head coach at Clemson. Uh, but, you know, just coming to work. Um, and w- unfortunately, we were in the middle of a disappointing season. We were three and three. We had lost at Wake Forest on a Thursday night and really had no clue. I mean, like, no clue. We lost on a Thursday night. I'm out on Friday recruiting and doing our thing normal. We're meeting on Sunday, work. We had, we had a 7 a.m. staff meeting that Monday morning. I actually had the devotion that morning. And, uh, <laughs> And then, yeah, you know, just a n- normal normal staff meeting. Mondays are long days, and you know, I'm in sweatpants. I'm in sweatpants and a sweatshirt, you know, and you know, because we're just gonna be in the cave all day. And uh, about I was about ten thirty, ten forty five, and the ops guy walks in and he says, uh, "Into the offensive staff room." Says Coach Bowden needs to see the staff. Hmm. And it was just a really weird. That never ever. We'd already had a staff meeting, so it was really weird. We were in the middle of blitz pickup. I remember that. We're getting ready for Georgia Tech. Paul Johnson's first year running the option. He just got in there. We're getting ready for them. We're working, studying their defense. And next thing you know, we're all in the staff room, and you could just tell something wasn't right. And sure enough, he comes in. He, he wasn't long. He just said, listen, you know, it's going to be a change. And, and just said how much he appreciated us. He'd be talking to us. And, and a little bit more later, and man, he walks out, and the AD walks in, and – you know, if you know Terry Don Phillips, he's definitely not a man of many words. And he just basically apologized, said, hey, you know, I hate that this is the way it the way it is. But this is something that Coach Bowden and I feel like is best. And uh, 
Uh, and he went, so uh, now, uh, Dabo, you're now the head coach, and you call all the <laughs> shots, and I need to see him in my office in five minutes. And he walked out. And and so and it was just this – I mean, I, I, I had, my body went numb. Like, I literally thought I was going to throw up. I really had a – I felt like I was going to throw up. And my body was numb. He walks out of the room, and I mean, I don't even know – I had no, like, feeling in my hands. And people were throwing their notebooks and slamming pencils down, and it was just like everybody was just trying to – and then all of a sudden it just it just got quiet. And, and everybody's kind of looking at me, and I'm like, you know, look, I don't even know what to say. I was like, you know, I, I said, let me go meet with him, guys. And I had I – had, I did not have good thoughts. You know, everything was negative thoughts in my head. My family, man, my job, my players, you know, uh, just moving, you know, all this stuff. Uh, and uh, – I said, you know, let me go meet with him and and we'll get back together here in a little bit. I walk in and he tells me, you know, that that he'd been watching me for five and a half years. And he goes into this whole spiel about, you know, listen, I, you know, I, I think you're what we need. And I'm going to I want you to be the head coach for seven weeks and I'm going to support you, whatever you think you need to do to fix this. And he goes into all this stuff. And because I went in like a deep breath, this is going to be a miserable miserable seven weeks, you know, and he's going to tell me, yeah, maybe I'll get the next guy to keep you if you do a good job. And, and he's in there telling me that he's going to interview me for the job. Everything he's paid attention to for the fa past five and a half years, why he thinks that I'm what Clemson needs and why he's pulling for me. But then, Oh, by the way, I'm going to hire the best coach for Clemson. I'm going to do a national search. He goes, but you're going to get an interview. And then he goes, and Dabo, I'll be honest with you, I'd like to see you get this job. And then he goes, <laughs> where it would help if you could win a few ball games. And, uh, you know, it's like – And, so and then history. Yeah, I walk out of there. Like, I went from one extreme to the other. Like, wow. like Some peppy, some peppy stuff. Yeah, like, I got a chance. You know, I mean, I got – for seven weeks, I get to be the head coach. And uh, and it started from there. And literally, I, I, I literally that's how I thought I went. I drove to my neighbor's house, you know, Jeff Davis. And uh, I said, hey, I need you to come I, for seven weeks. OG, I get OGs. Coach. Hey, hey, neighbor, for seven weeks, I get to be the head coach. And guess what? I want you to come to Clemson football. You know, he was on campus raising money and stuff. And, and I was like, right. and here's what I want to do now. After seven weeks, you, know, you can go back to do that. But this is what at least we can do it and see if this works. And uh so we went four and two and I got the job and, you know, I'm still here. So literally I came here thinking I'd be here a year or two and rich. I just finished my 19th year. I I'm know. Rich, year 20. <laughs> year 20. My Come 14th on, so head coach. Obviously the biggest moments were two national championships. When you look back as a coach, what was about those teams? I was on both of those teams, by the way. I had a great experience in my time during Clemson. But what was it about those teams that allowed them to win it all. Because every year, you, you honestly, you would love to win it every year because we, obviously we try to. Yeah. But what is yeah. about those teams that made them special? Yeah. Well, you know, and every team, and you've heard me say this every year, I mean, every team is like a child to me. Like, you love them all. And they all have different personalities. They all have different challenges and things like that. Um, and, you know, those two teams, like, like in 16, that team, we lost in 15. And we really probably may have had our best team. But we right. we were uh, we just we just didn't we we thought we were good enough, you know, and and we got on that big stage in the national championship. We we gave up a kick return. We gave up an onside kick. But but when that game was over, we lost forty five to forty. I, I, I we lost the game, but I felt like mentally we won, and and it was kind of like we kind of crossed a hump mentally. Like our team walked out of there like. First of all, they were mad. Secondly, it was like, we know we're good enough. And and so the one thing about the 16 team. That was my first was, year. They, they, were, they were a little frustrated. It was a little frustrating. That team was really talented. But it was like that team just wanted to hit fast forward button. You know, it's like, can we just hit the fast forward button and get to the NAS championship and win the NAS championship? And that was a team that was – you know, a little bit of a challenge in, in really keeping them focused on the moment. And because of that, we had some games. A where, lot of nail I mean, we, yeah, yeah, I mean, we'd be up three touchdowns. And next thing you know, it was a, an onside kick. You know, we had a lot of tough moments. And then we, and as you remember, we ended up losing against Pitt that year. We played terrible in that game. And they kicked the ball. And, um, 
but it, it it just it was like they just wanted to like just fast forward. Uh, but I'll tell you what, after that pit game, it was like that was what they needed. And man, we we took off. But that team was was super talented. We had an unbelievable will to win. And I mean, they truly believed they were the best team. There was no doubt. And they had they were on a mission. I mean, they 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 wanted to finish, and they had a very clear vision. And, and a couple of you got to get lucky too, man. Like you got it. Like to, you went through this you year. Really do. Like we've, we've never been through a year like this. We stayed healthy. Deshaun Watson stayed healthy, you know, and so forth. And so, you know, we get to uh, uh, the playoffs, and man, here we go. Uh, we we won, you know, thirty-one to nothing against Ohio State, and and now you're playing game. Alabama. Yeah, you're playing Alabama again. And, and sure enough, it comes down to two minutes. You got to go the distance against the best team out there. And, and you saw that will to win. You saw that team with, with an unbelievable belief is what that team had. And, and I remember and in the saw- locker room when you guys – so we go in, obviously, uh, we're down 14-7. We go in the yep. locker room, and we're kind of looking around like we're – like, we, we, we've been talking about like, we got to win this game. We're in second – this is second year. It's my first year on the team. This is the second time in the national championship. Playing the same team, and you come in the locker room because so the way locker room works. So we'll be in the locker room just chilling. Hopefully, usually we're up, but we're not up this time. Everybody's kind of looking around, and you come in, and you get on top of the chair, and you're like, "Hey, I don't know how we're gonna win this game, but we're gonna win it because of love." And everybody's yeah. like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." We go out there, and the rest is history. And you saw that 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 team had a belief, and they had a love. And I did have, I was like, you know what, man, listen, everybody take a deep breath, you know, just, just settle down. Let's play, just play the next play. In the end, we're going to win the game. You know, the 18 team was just so talented. Like you had all those guys who came back and they came back for one reason. And I mean, and that, and, and we, the difference in 18 and 16 is that 18 team dominated every Game. game like they dominated all year. We had the one game where where Trevor got hurt and Chase had to come in, but which was they were so just dominant. I mean, it was a dominant, dominant team all the way, all the way to the you know we we dominate Notre Dame and then you beat Alabama. I mean, and everybody you know that Alabama team had Jalen, Tua, Mac Jones, receiver Wall. Ruggs, Judy, Devontae, they had Damien in running back, Najee at running back, Josh Jacobs. I didn't even mention anybody else. And we were 44 team. But that team, and so that team was just dominant. This the 16 team was full of belief and love. And uh, you know, and and so that's what made them special. So one one of the biggest things that's happened recently is Coach V and Coach Elliott leaving. And for me, like every off season since I've been even before I was there, it's always been like, well, is it the, is it the time? Is it not the time? And coach, I mean, they were all they were always transparent with us. I mean, Coach Elliott, I remember Travis was the funniest because he was like, I "Man, you leaving every year?" He's like, "You leaving?" And coach, like, I don't think it's time. Me and Coach talked about it, and then I mean, B for the longest time was just like never leaving. Like he, yeah. For long, we always thought we'd talk to the sons, Jake and T Bone, and be like, "He's like, yeah, he don't want to be a head coach." And we're here about him turning down jobs, like, I mean, big time jobs. He was just like, oh, I don't want it. So, how does it feel? And how was like your perspective on both of these guys leaving and the timing of it all and just seeing yep. the process for them? Well, man, it's, it's perfect timing because it's always on God's time. And uh, this was the right time. And I was, man, it's awesome. I mean, I, 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 you know, you love to see your players develop. And be prepared for whatever's coming next. Just like I'm sitting here talking to you, and man, and, and just who you are as a man and a person and a player, and how the development that you've had, uh, and you take a lot of pride in that. But but also take a lot of pride in seeing the staff develop. And you know, Brent, honestly, if it wasn't the Oklahoma job, he'd still be at Clemson. Uh, know. You know, that, that was the, that was a job that I think he had enough comfort and familiarity with, and like, okay, this is this is what he wants to go do, and. Man, I, I was so and, and you know people are like, oh my, I, there's nobody happy. I mean, I'm thrilled, and you know, I I thought he there was a couple of jobs he probably should have taken, but <laughs> he just didn't have peace about it. I mean, great jobs, and I'm like, oh okay, great, you know. And so, uh, same thing with Tony. You know, this was the one job 
Tony's had a few jobs, uh, but this was the one that I really gave him my blessing on, um, you know, because I, I really, you know, Tony, you know, I'm not old enough to be his dad, but he, I really look at him like a son. I mean, we have that type of relationship and, and I just want him to be successful. And I, I just, man, this was, this was a great fit for him, it, you know, for his family, just who he is as a man and a coach. I mean, it, there's just, there's, I think going to be a great alignment uh, for, for how he wants to do it. So, man, I was so excited and I did everything I could to help, uh, him get the job. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's sad that, you know, we don't get to be together every day, but man, I'm so proud of him and I'm so happy. And then it created some opportunity for some of my peripheral staff to get some, some new opportunity, but then it also allowed me to hire some new people, promote some people that were very deserving and, uh, and very ready. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, continuity is great and change is great. They're both great. Um, so yeah, I, I love, you know, where we are and, and uh, the timing is perfect. What do you, not only for next season, what is your expectation? What is the dream now for the next 10 years? Cause you've seen 10 years yeah. of this. All right. And the best is yet to come, man. You, so how does that happen? Well, you got to keep your dreams greater than your memories. You know, as well as anybody, it's a windshield mentality, right? It's, it, we, man, we learn, we grow from what's behind us, but man, it's always about what's next and it's attacking what's next and it's starting over every year. People ask me all the time, is it, is it, you know, they, they look at where we are and they'll say, okay, was it harder? Is it harder to build it or harder to sustain it? And, and my answer is, I don't know. We're still building, you know, so, you know, greatness is always under construction. So the answer to your question is, man, it's, it's, it's striving to be our best and continuing to, to, to build a, a, a model program uh, to, you know, not chase championships, to chase young men's hearts and to keep the main thing, the main thing. You win with people. Our purpose has not changed. The standard has not changed. The foundation of our program is well established. And uh, so, you know, we'll stand on that and we'll continue to build. And, and uh, I hope this will be the winningest decade in Clemson history. Not last, last, last decade. You're the first inaugural coach to go through your players making money. Um, what are your thoughts on NIL? And then the last one is going to be a special one for my Clemson fans. Yeah, well, you know, I've, you know, there, despite what you may hear, or read, or what people <laughs> like to create all these, all these narratives, as you all know, uh, you know, just like the old social media stuff, you know, every, every August I write this terrible article about how I banned y'all from social media. I know. And, uh, I've never banned anybody. That was always a player led thing. And uh, so, you know, it's the same thing with the, with the NIL. Uh, I, I love, I think the NIL is great. I think it's common sense. Like to me, like why should a guy not be able to go do an autograph session and work and make money? Why should somebody not be able to go home and do a camp? Why, there's some common sense things. I worked all through college. I don't know if I was supposed to or not, but there was no way I was going to survive if I wasn't umpiring, cleaning gutters or cutting grass when any spare time I had, but I had to do it on my time, you know, and when I was supposed to be at practice, I was practicing at meetings. It's not like I was going to them saying, Hey, listen, I, I can't be here today. Uh, so, I mean, I was out working, uh, had Sweeney gutters, you know, going on back in those days and that's how I survived. But you know, I think that is very much common sense. Uh, I, but I do think there are like anything, some unintended consequences going on with it uh, where it's being used in a way that it's not intended. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think that's good. Uh, I think that uh, what I and people say, oh, Coach Sweeney, that I'm, I'm, I'm not against NIL at all. What I am against is anything that devalues education. Right. That's what I'm against. And, and I'm against the professionalization of college athletics. And what does that mean? Well, you know, that means, OK, now we're paying you guys their salaries and 18 year olds have to pay taxes and they got to, you know, I, I don't think that's that's good. I think. We should keep the focus on graduation, incentivize graduation, and do everything we can to modernize and improve the scholarship in addition to these NIL opportunities. I think it's great. But again, with the NIL, with, with the transfer portal, there, there, are some, there are some things going on that, that I don't think is sustainable. And, uh, and I don't think it's, it's good for a lot of young people. I mean, um, you know, I mean, you're talking 18, 19, 20 year olds that uh, shouldn't be equipped, you know, I mean, and, and it's 
And again, 98% are not going to play in the NFL. So let's help them maximize this for sure. But let's, let's, let's don't, let's don't allow some of the craziness that's, that's creeping up and, and, and like this transfer stuff, you know, being on the road for the last two weeks, the biggest issue is a lot of colleges don't sign high school kids anymore. And, and the high school coaches are, are up in arms about it. I can't tell you how many high schools I've been in the last two weeks and the coaches are so frustrated because they won't sign their kids, you know, because if, if the kid goes there and has a good year, he's leaving, whereas they can sign these portal guys. And there's 3,000 guys in the portal and there's not enough spots for them to go. So they know – Kids are going to fall down to them. So there's just this, I think, unhealthy dynamic right now. But it'll all settle out. Like anything, you know, you kind of learn as you go. It'll all settle out. Everybody's kind of figuring it out. Uh, you know, and as you know, the NIL stuff, uh, which, again, I think is great. Uh, we're, we're as well equipped to handle that as anybody in the country with what we've been doing for in years with Paul Journey and equipped. This is just another one of those things that we have to help our guys navigate and take advantage of. You know, let's maximize the opportunity. Let's don't, maximize. Don't lose focus. But don't lose focus. Don't let short-term money become the focus. Let's keep the long-term focus on the value of education, on development as a player, performance, relationships, foundational things for life, you know, all those things. And that's our job as adults to help navigate that and having the resources in place to do it. Not a great answer. All right, last one for the Clemson fans. And we out. Coach Williams, go to the Suns basketball game. Hope play goes for 20 tonight. All right, if you can do this, you get five recruits. So Coach Williams has been recruiting for, the, for the, the years to come. You get five recruits to build Clemson football from the ground up. <laughs> Positionless, offense, defense. You can go special teams if you want to. Probably not. I know you won't do that. Yeah. You get yeah. five players. Yeah. Who are you going with? So tell us yeah. who and give us a little reason yeah. at the end. Yeah, I will never answer that question, uh, Rich, <laughs> you know, because I love all my players. And as soon as I answer that question, I'm going to be getting 100 emails and texts and all that. I will I'll, I will give you one name. All right. all right. I'll give you one name. All right. And that'd be Grady Jarrett. If I had to, an old oh, two star recruit, uh, you know, man, that guy, I, I mean, he'd be in my top five. And, uh, I'll let everybody else dream and figure out who the other four well, are. The other four, for sure. It'll be hard, but yeah, ain't no, ain't no way I'm answering that. I love all my guys. That'd be a tough one, but but I guarantee you, Grady Jarrett be in there, no doubt, because he's the epitome of what Clemson football is all about. It's a great answer. Hey, thank you for coming on to the show. I appreciate you. It's been a great episode. Uh, my always coach, Coach Sweeney. I love you, Rich. I'm proud of you, man. Keep it rolling, brother. Love you, Coach. Yeah. That was amazing. Um, and so hopefully you guys got to see what I've gotten to experience throughout my time playing um, underneath Coach Twenty, sitting in team meetings, uh, whether it's sitting in his house, talking to him. Those are all the stories. And even, he's got even more. Trust me, if we had another hour, I would give it to you. But we had to keep it short, um, as short as we can. Uh, but like, like I said, man, that, that guy, that man, uh, the most respect, the most love, um, and just for who he is as a person, as a coach, as a father, all that good stuff. He's incredible. So I'm glad he came on the show. Maybe we'll get him on in weeks ahead, episodes ahead. We'll have him come on again in the future. Uh, but hey, you guys, look, we're at the end of another episode. Here's what I need, he, here's what I need, need you to know. We're almost at 2,000 subscribers. And we care about this stuff. We do. We, like, follow the page. You haven't followed the page. Keep liking the content because liking is supporting. Comment. We love communicating on every platform comment but it really is a good milestone for us to hit that 2,000 subscribers so I, I look at the numbers these, these shows are getting thousands of views but we don't have thousands of subscribers yet so there's a little something's broken so I need you if you're watching the show if you see the show if you get to the end to the end of the show and you've, you've enjoyed your time no we're putting in work to continue to make this thing good and we want to hit 2,000 subscribers so hey it's on you I need you to come through for me just go ahead and hit the subscribe thing. I know you've probably subscribed to things before, but this, you, this is gonna be different. You're gonna like it. All right, so I'm counting on you. And I'm thanking you for tuning into another show. Uh, I say this every week because I feel like it, it really is true. This is one of my favorite shows. How can I not say that? I had, just had my former coach on, or my forever coach on. Uh, and who who gets the, what player is getting the coach on the podcast? But me, 
you know, well, maybe, maybe not but me, but I feel like it. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in to another episode. Uh, we'll see you next week with another special guest. It's been real. Players Club Podcast by the players for the people. And I'm your host, Gary Richards.